Hey, Print Hustlers, Bruce from Printavo here. We are really, really excited to be able to have Lon Winters in our sneak peek of Print Hustlers Cow 2020. He's the owner of Graphic Elephants out of Elizabeth, Colorado. Um, Lon is just a workflow beast. And, you know, we really see him at all the trade shows. And I'm always poking through his books and, and, and all his notes that he's got on the tables there. If you haven't met him, he's really, really detailed in it. So I'm very, very excited to be able to have him in this year's Prognosis Conf. Lon, no, thanks so much for being able to spend some time with us today. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So I'm just going to hop in. You're a big lover of the pre-press, the pre-production element. Why is that? Why do you care so much about that aspect? I kind of define our process in an oversimplified manner, and I've said this a number of times. Um, if you kind of define our process quickly by saying, okay, we start with art, uh, however, which way we, we create it or import it or, or uh, design it, we have to separate that art or we tear, tear the colors apart. We rebuild it uh, in screen making. We pick colors uh, or color match. We go to press. We do the setup piece of it. And then we run production. So I've just described five or six oversimplified pieces of the process. But by definition, five of the six or four of the five or however many I described are pre-press. So if I control and do the best I can with these pieces within the process, the production part of it starts to take care of itself. So our process is kind of a, a I'll use a lot of cliches, um, we're only as strong as the weakest link within that process. So if we if we start with bad art, we're going to never get great printing. If we don't make a good screen, we're going to struggle on press. If we use not a superior product, uh, whether it's mesh or ink on press, we're gonna struggle. So there's a, a number of things that we can control along the way within the pre-press part of it that become the absolute necessities to make a production run well. I got it. What would you say is one big tip to be able to help improve that screen making aspect so that you know, you've got a really smooth, efficient print process? You know, you have to start to uh, wrap your arms around some of the variables. Our business is just filled with variables, thousands right. of variables. And a lot of times, you know, this isn't the same for everybody, but people get into the business because it's fun and creative and exciting. But ultimately, you can't uh, spend your entire day troubleshooting, getting through jobs. You have to have to be productive. You have to uh, generate revenue at the end of the day in excess of your expenses. And I think understanding that there's this magic balance of controlling the variables and still being creative is critically important. And there's so many details within the screen making piece of it that you have to start to measure something. And if you can measure it, then you can start to control it. So whether that's measuring tension or stencil thickness or uh, moisture in, in the, the stencil itself, uh, all of those things are important, but you have to start with something. And what we usually work with our clients with is, is I'll travel with some of those gauges, but we'll start them with something simple. Let's start with a tension meter and let's begin to control our, our tension, which is the resistant force, which controls a whole lot of the rest of the math in our process. Um, I'll go into more detail during the uh, Print Hustlers Conference on some of those items. But ultimately, the, the key is beginning to start to wrap your arms around the variables. And the more you begin to control, the more you want to control. So one piece of equipment to measure one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Then ultimately, you begin to control what you must. Got it. It seems like every single shop that I'm lucky enough to chat with, also says that direct to screen, computer to screen is one of the best pieces of equipment that they buy around the first auto stage. Is that really play into this pre-press process and just helping to create a more consistent screen essentially? Absolutely, there's hundreds of places to look for sure. But even before CTS, we would work with customers that had multiple automatics and they were looking at, we've got to increase our production 50% this summer. Um, so I'm looking at buying two more automatics and a dryer. And if you look at most people's processes, it's it's take two steps back and, and put the 300,000 back in your pocket. What you need to be is more efficient on turning screens. So once CTS became a little more mainstream, that became a no brainer at 
you can make an argument pretty easily even at a single automatic. And you can make an argument for multiple manuals. The manufacturer states about 40 screens a day. If you make about 40 screens a day, you can get an ROI in less than three years, even two years in some cases. I'd argue that it may be even less than that because of the, the tangible things that you can go through. Uh, you can make a list of them that the manufacturers would give to you. No fill, no glass, no, all, the, all the stuff that we understand. And that's tangible. The intangible things like not losing a piece of film or not being able to find last month's art or the storage of films. There's a bunch of additional things, dirt on the film that, or for some reason, the white no longer fits with the rest of the film. You got to re output the whole, all the film. There's, there's just a, a laundry list of intangible things that you pick up additional productivity time. I mean, pre-registration systems have been around forever. With CTS, they work. Without CTS, you got to work pretty hard to make them work. So there's just a ton of things that make CTS at a the entry level point is somewhere around thirty thousand. Say, you you can make really good sense of it. I think even at say twenty five screens a day, when you start to add up the intangibles. We bought our first one five years ago, pretty close to the day, and. I bought it because I wanted it, not because I needed it. And at least I thought that. And I don't know how we could go back to film now. Just the workflow that it changes. Um, but I would, I'd argue additional automation in pre-press as well. Um, onboard exposure, uh, automatic developing, automatic reclaim. There's a lot of other areas that you could automate as well. But CTS is, is definitely number one. That's awesome. That's really great to hear. Are there any common missteps that you see? So with newer clients that you start consulting with, it sounds like pre-press is something that you dive in very heavily. Shop overall, though, with everything, people, organization, all of that. Is there a couple common things that you see that's across many of the contracts that you work with? There's something that we can't teach anybody that I see. And we say this shop at shops that are struggling we can't teach culture mm -hmm. and if you got bad culture you, the, the only thing we can do is identify it now we you know going to spend a week with a, a client it's not like we really understand the culture but you can see pieces of it i'm sure in in your travels you kind of see take a step back and go wow that's that's a messed up culture right there and you can't fix that without an inside out kind of work at it. So sometimes it's shop owners that are personifying that culture. And mm. that's a tough thing to have a conversation with. But the, the places that are rock and rolling that have good culture, that's the common thread on the people that seem to be, now that, you know, hey, if business is good, culture seems to be pretty good. And when business is bad, culture suffers. But sure. I, I think those are things that are hard to, to, to sell but are really, you can see shops that are organized and the people like what they do. They want to come to work. They show up a little early. They, they stay a little late. You know, they love kind of our industry culture is kind of getting more to the excitement stage again. People love doing what they do. Uh, I think we went through a phase where things got a little flat and boring and same old, same old. Um, you know, some of the, the, the younger generation is, is, is putting that excitement and that rock and roll back into it, which has been a lot of fun to be a part of because it's kind of my second wave of the <laughs> of the rock and roll culture. I'm yeah. dating myself a little bit now, but um, that piece of it is, is pretty cool. No, you're right. I actually see that too. I mean, you see it at the, the shows, right? I mean, so many shops mm -hmm. now that are the, the younger generation that started are from bands and... Uh, and then they're printing for their friends who are in bands and it, it yeah that or, or like a lot of files you see you know um biking or uh racing that kind of stuff so sure um but that's where our roots are from in the business anyway yeah I mean, this all 100%. started with rock and roll and i think that's pretty cool 100 percent. with the culture aspect that's not something obviously that you can buy or that changes overnight Maybe somebody bought into the business or it just got out of control. It's not the culture that they want. How does somebody change that? How does somebody affect that? To me, it's super painful um, to have that original conversation with the people that are writing the checks. I mean, even if it's a, a technical area that they need help in screen making or on press components or whatever it is, the, the conversation with the, the people writing the checks, they, they kind of have a suspicion on where the issues might be. Most people that are that I think are in a, in a rough environment 
bad culture type of situation kind of know that usually that attitude comes from the top down so there's some internal things that a, a business owner has to kind of really look in the mirror and 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 i think we've all done it as business owners um sometimes you know you're upset at your your own people for their attitude and and sometimes you're the one creating that attitude that culture that yeah. situation so you know i I'm so glad to talk about process instead of uh, uh, pandemics, but th that has kind of put us in a position to reevaluate and really work hard as business owners or team leaders in keeping things focused down the road and being positive because it's real easy to get pretty depressed if you watch the news and bottom falls out of your workload and sure. people aren't paying their bills. And, you know, it's real easy to have a team meeting and tell everybody how terrible things are after you've laid off people. And I mean, it, it, it's tough times, but I think it's really a time for team leaders, business owners, uh, business leaders to, to really look in the mirror and, and focus on their own culture to, to be able to that reflect in what you're doing with your customers, what you're doing with your, your employees, your team leaders as well. So um, it's complicated. That, that was kind of a long answer to it's really complicated. I mean, it's interesting though, that you bring that up because you know, you can measure and measure and there's a lot of uh, analytical aspects to it, but you're right. Like the culture is, is definitely way overlooked as far as the efficiency goes, right? I, I mean, having somebody that really cares about working for you is the one that's picking things up off the ground, right? Yep. It could probably give, shoot, I mean, 40% more to the company than somebody who's just there trying to collect the check and then leaves, you know, as soon as possible. Um, no question. So that is a really huge thing. And, and maybe, you know, it's interesting. I was chatting with uh, Danny Gruninger too right before. And, and he was talking about how he's just trying to give ownership and talk with his team members. And we were talking about their folks that are washing out screens. And as that's a tough kind of starter job, how to create that sense of ownership and get their feedback and have them feel as part of the family too. Is there any tip that you feel that, that you do maybe specifically at Graphic Elements with your team to be able to help create that sense of ownership and that care uh, that you have for the business that, that you want them to have too. I think that it's key to create a sense of ownership. Well, we try to work on some, some profit sharing uh, opportunities, especially with our key people, people that have been with us a long time. Our best people have been with us 25 years, um, one thirty years. So almost from the start, things have changed. We've been through a lot together besides the, the money piece of it, and that's always important to everybody, you can tell when, when we're doing really well. You know, presses are flying, I'm all over the country, we're, our income level is obviously at a solid level. And that's when we try to be as generous as possible because we'll have lean months too, and we'll have difficult times. And they'll need to understand there's not a whole lot of Friday pizza parties that are gonna go on in February. But when things are really humming and we can we can hand out some some bonuses and just some incentive types of things, we try to do that. And then, you know, the culture is always reflective of things like cleanliness and organization and really push on that constantly. If you take pride in your own workspace, that reflects in how the rest of the operation is set up. And uh, and everybody's typically working on everybody else to, hey, you know kind of like two brothers living in a room together. You know, if, if one of them uh, stays pretty clean and starts helping the other one stay a little cleaner, then all of a sudden the room's a lot cleaner. But if they both are, you know, if one's a pig and, and the other one uh, kind of uh, falls into that influence, all of a sudden they, they've got an absolute mess. And I think that misery loves company and, and everybody kind of falls into a, a space that they're comfortable with. So really the team leaders and the leaders within your your staff have to really set a solid example. And then it goes all the way up. You got to be a neat freak so that they're neat freaks. Sure. It's the lead by example. That's awesome one. Thank you for, for being able to spend a bit of time with us today. We're really excited. Again, guys, you can join us and you can hear more about Lon and, and what he's going to be talking about and for in Print House for his comp this year. Again, it's July 23rd and 24th. You can click the link down below to be able to join and register. And we'll see you guys there. Thanks, Lon. Awesome. Thanks. Talk to you soon.